The first set of cryptographic hashing tools that we will have a look at in Kali Linux are the Sum Tools collection. Because calculating file hashes is a very useful thing to do on all computers, GNU Linux distributions come with a set of programs that calculate a variety of different hash values. These are known as the summary tools, or just the sum tools. You can see these tools are obviously for the MD5 and SHA family of hashing algorithms. These are command line programs, and each can generate their own respective hash values from digital information found in a file or file stream. They can also compare pre-calculated hash values to digital information present in a file to make a positive identification of digital assets. Each sum tool is used in the same way, so I won't need to demonstrate each tool individually. Once you know how one works, you'll know them all. The best way to have a look at the sum tools is to see them in action on the command line. In this demo, we will cover how to help and how to find help in Linux for using sum tools. Next, we will look at using the sum tools to create hashes and hash sets. Finally, we'll see how to use hashes to identify files and test if a file has changed. I'll also show you a few tricks for manipulating the output of the sum tools. The first thing you always need to know is how to find help for any GNU Linux tool you are using. You can see the command line usage for the hashing tools demonstrated in this module by running the tool with the dash help option. This is the quickest way to find out or remind yourself what a command line program can do. You can see the full Linux manual page for a tool using the man command with the command's name. Because some tools are part of the GNU core utilities, you can read the full documentation for a tool using the info command with the command's name. This is basically the command's manual page with a lot of explanations added. Okay. Now let's get down to looking at sum tools and some command line action. To calculate the hashes of files using a sum tool, just put the file names on the command line after the tool name. The output will be a hash value followed by the file name for each file listed on the command line. If you specify files to hash using a path name, the full path will also be displayed in the sum tools output. We can also hash input as a file stream. However, the file name is not present in the input and is lost, so it is replaced by a hyphen in the output. In digital forensics, you will be working mostly with files and not file streams, so you won't be using redirection very often, if ever at all. If you have a lot of files to hash, you can use wildcards in the file names to make things a bit easier. If you attempt to hash everything in a directory, you may see some error messages created by some tools attempting to hash unhashable file objects, such as subdirectories and files that your user account does not have permission to read. If you don't want those Linux standard error messages to be displayed, then you'll need to redirect the standard error output to dev null. There, that's nice and clean. The errors still occur, but the error messages themselves are sent to Linux Bitbucket, so you don't see them. To create a hash set that we can use later for identifying files, all you need to do is redirect the output of a sum tool to a file. All we have done here is to save the output of the sum tool to a file named md5hash.txt, as we can see here. This is the most basic hash set file format you will encounter. It's just the hash value and the name of the file it was generated from. We can then use the sum tools to check if any previously hashed files have changed using the dash check option. OK is the indication that the current hash value of the files match the hash value of the same file names in the hash set in md5sums.txt. Now let's change one of the files so the hash sum will not match. What I did was append the string this is a change to the file evidence underscore one.txt. Now, let's run the hash set check again. Now we see a failed message indicating that the current hash value of evidence underscore one dot txt does not match the hash value for the same file name in md5sums.txt. This means the file has changed or is a different file with the same name. The sum tools finds the files to check in the current folder, so you don't specify the file name to check. If a file is listed and the hash set is not found in the local directory, then you also get a failed open or read error message indicating the file was not found. If you don't want to see the OK messages, but want to see all the error messages, use the dash quiet option. 
If there are no errors, then no output will appear, which can be a useful indicator when writing a shell script that calls the sum tools. If you don't want to see OK or failed messages when checking a hash set file, then use the dash status option. As you can see from the Linux standard error message, this is a good way only to check if any of the files listed in the hash set are missing from the current directory. If you don't want to see the Linux standard error messages either, then you'll need to redirect the standard error output to dev null. For the rest of the demo, let me switch to using the SHA-1 hashing algorithm. Here's what our hash set now looks like with SHA-1 hashes. Realize that a simple hash set file only stores the hash values for one type of hashing algorithm. If you use the wrong hash set for a hashing tool, such as the SHA-1 hash set with an MD5 hashing tool, you will get an error from the sum tools complaining about improperly formatted checksum lines. Putting the name of the hashing algorithm in the hash set's file's name or extension is the best way to catch this mistake. Now, if you do want to write scripts that call the sum tools, you need to know that each tool returns a value of 0 if the hash check operation was successful, and a value of 1 if an error occurred. Here are the integer values of each result. In a script, you will just test if a zero or a non-zero value was returned. Once again, this is only useful if you are calling a sum tool from a shell script and need to programmatically check the success or failure of the call. If you will not be writing shell scripts, then this is not useful to you. And finally, the sum tools have flags to specify if the input files contain 8-bit binary data or 7-bit text-only data. Here is an example of how they are used. The T flag expects to read 7-bit bytes from the input, while the B flag expects to read 8-bit bytes. When run on Kali Linux, the only difference in the output is the appearance of an asterisk before the file name to indicate the hash was created from binary input using the B flag. This is because Kali Linux does not differentiate between opening files in text mode or in binary mode. All files are binary to Kali, so regardless of the flag used, the hash value is always the same. However, the sum tools also run on operating systems that do differentiate between text and binary input mode, so that's why these flags are needed. The sum tools provide very basic hashing capabilities using the MD5 and SHA hashing algorithms. Some tools can create and use hash sets to check the identity of files and to determine if files have changed. The sum tools can read both files and file streams and be used in shell scripts. And you will find some tools on all GNU Linux systems.